Good evening all, and welcome. Sorry, I decided to take an extra birthday day off, as an additional birthday present from all of you lovely folk to myself. Thank you for the gift. I really appreciated it. So, tonight we have the long-awaited cabin stories. I made it a bit longer than usual as a thank you for your patience. So for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. This story took place over the summer. My friend Jonathan had the house all to himself for the week and he invites me to spend the weekend with him. Since we were both 15, having the house to ourselves was great. I arrived at his house on Friday night. Jonathan's two younger brothers, Saeed and Ivan, were also there, but we didn't really mind as they stayed out of our way. Around 9.30, Saeed and Ivan wanted to play hide and seek in the dark outside. Jonathan's house is located at the far end of his neighborhood, and behind his house are the woods. We agreed, grabbed flashlights and headed to the woods. Saeed and I continued first while Jonathan and Ivan ran into the woods and hid. After about a minute, we went looking for them. For around five minutes, both of us walked around and shone our flashlights all over the place hoping to find them. We soon reached a small trail that led away from our path, which was odd because I couldn't recall ever seeing it before. We followed it and a minute later appeared on a small clearing, and in front of us, maybe 30 yards away, was an odd looking shack. It appeared abandoned, was rather small, and the wood was old and charred. The steps leading to the front door were well run down, and the windows had shattered glass. Both of us looked unsure as we stared at the shack. Something wasn't right. None of us had ever gone this deep into the woods, let alone at night. But we also thought that this was where Jonathan and Ivan had hidden. We both walked slowly to the shack. I hopped onto the porch and made a loud creaking noise. I heard movement coming from inside. Saeed stayed back and I nodded to him, indicating they must be inside. I went over to one of the broken windows, careful to avoid the glass. I peeked inside the shack, shining my light inside, and screamed in horror when I saw a figure hunched in the far corner. His eyes darted to where I was as the light shone on him. He had a scruffy beard, wide-eyed and wore a heavy brown coat. But what terrified me the most was when his mouth curled into a sinister smile the moment he saw me. I got off the porch and Saeed began to ask what was wrong, but I yelled at him to run. We ran and reached the end of the path and ran back in the direction of Jonathan's house. I saw two pairs of lights in front of us and seconds later we saw Jonathan and Ivan. I frantically explained to them about the shack and what I saw. Both didn't believe me, but before I could explain any more, we heard branches being crushed behind us and heavy footsteps getting closer. We all sprinted away and immediately reached the house. Jonathan quickly unlocked the door and we all bolted in. We stayed silent for a moment before explaining what I had seen. We were all still a bit scared and felt uneasy, especially considering that the footsteps we heard were most likely that same man from the shack. We turned on a movie to try to calm ourselves down and forget what had happened. At 20 past midnight, the movie was ending. We saw one of the lights from the back porch turn on. We had a clear view of the back porch from where we were all sitting. The lights were the ones that turn on when movement is detected. Jonathan and I got up and slowly went towards the back porch screen door to see. We pulled the curtains and gasped when we saw a large figure hopping the fence. I was worried and scared as I thought it was the same man from the shack. We debated on what to do, but I decided that if it was indeed the same man, we had to call the cops as he now knew where we lived. Two officers arrived at Jonathan's house and we explained to them the whole situation about the shack and the man being in the backyard. A separate cop was called and two of them went to search the woods while one cop stayed with us. 
after half hour. The two officers returned and told us they found the shack but no man. However, they did find meth, a sleeping bag, a candle, and a hunting knife. The cops said the man was probably some homeless meth addict who had used the shack as a place to stay. To this day, I still wonder what the man was doing when he entered the backyard and what he would have done if we had all gone to sleep and didn't notice the porch light turn on. We were at our family cabin deep within the Norwegian woods. There's no running water in the cabin in the winter as the pipes tend to freeze. We get drinking water from a nearby lake and water we use for washing and cleaning we get from melting and boiling snow. This started one winter as my father went outside to fill a tin can with snow. As he crouched down by the side of the cabin, removed the lid from the can and filled it with snow. As he turned around to put the lid back on, it was gone. No big deal, he thought. It probably slid or blew away, and since it was dark out, he went back inside without the lid. The next day, we went outside and looked but never found it, and eventually forgot about it. Life went on, and the next winter, when we were at the cabin once again, we still used the same tin can to collect snow, still without a lid. My dad went outside, filled the can, and as he turned around, he heard a weird sound as he took a step. There it was, on top of the new snow, at the same place he placed it one year ago. He was pale as a ghost when he came back inside. This particular event happened to me when I was around 10 or 11 years old. But I have been visiting my grandma's cabin in Big Bear Lake several times a year since I was a child. This isn't the first strange event to happen to me there, but it is definitely the most memorable. A little backstory. My grandma's cabin sits at the end of a cul-de-sac right at the edge of a vast, mostly unpopulated stretch of forest. No matter what I do or how I'm feeling, I always have a very strong sensation that I'm being watched when I'm in many of the rooms in the cabin alone, day or night. I've seen shadow creatures many times in the cabin, have heard strange knocking, whispers, and just generally feel like there is something else living there with us. My grandma has told me of similar experiences and has warned me before that if I ever get a strange feeling when I'm walking in the forest to go home immediately, but she never elaborated. Anyway, me and my dad and uncle were walking on a trail that we've been on hundreds of times before. When we reached the first peak of hill that we usually like to stop and look out at the view from. My dad and uncle wanted to keep hiking for a bit, but I decided to go back to the cabin on my own as it was only five to 10 minutes away. I head down the usual path that I go on not too thinking much about it, when I realize I have no idea where I am. Everything looked the same as usual, but something was wrong. The normal path was different in a way I can't really explain. It seemed to be 10 times as long as usual. Everything was silent, and there was absolutely no wildlife about, not even a squirrel. I kept having all of these morbid thoughts coming into my head about how I was lost forever, or some sort of creature was going to swoop me up. Every 10 or so minutes, I ended up at a part of the trail that I definitely recognized, only to be in a completely alien area moments later. The path kept winding and winding downhill, and the sun was setting pretty rapidly. I had to have been walking in the direction of the cabin for more than an hour because I remember I kept checking my watch and panicking. At this point, I just accepted that I was lost. I finally made it down to the street and was relieved to be able to orient myself, but I was only one street away from the cabin, although I should have been much further away. I was expecting my father and uncle to be home by now and for my parents to be worried about me being gone for so long, but instead, my mother asked me why I was home so soon. I asked my dad how long they were out there, but they said that they'd only walked maybe 15 minutes longer from when I left them. 
I don't know if I'm just reading too much into this, and if I were a kid with different perceptions, but something definitely felt very off about that entire ordeal. It began in summer of 2013, when I got a divorce and had to move out of my home in the suburbs of Southern California. I met someone, my current husband, pretty soon after the divorce, and things moved quickly, as he asked me to move in with him and I accepted. He had just brought his dream cabin on a local mountain range, with an inheritance he received. We are in Southern California, and the mountain and lake are popular tourist destinations. At the time, I was struggling a lot. I had to quit my teaching job due to severe stress, and had lost a substantial amount of weight, and was barely weighing 100 pounds. Looking back, I was probably an easy target due to my vulnerable state. We moved that winter just in time for me to vacate my previous home, that I had once shared with my ex. It had just stormed and there was ice and snow on the ground. The new house was really dark, and just felt sad to me, especially on cold, snowy days. But it was a beautiful cabin that was on a long, private dirt road in the woods. The house was a larger chalet-style home, with dark wooden beams, bricks, and wood walls with a big old wood-burning stove. Shortly after moving in, we found out that the lady that previously owned it was hit by a drunk driver, and had to move into a care facility for the severely impaired, which kind of creeped us out a bit. I immediately realized I didn't quite like living in the mountains. The people in the town, especially our handful of neighbors, were really strange, paranoid and rough. There was just a negative energy there, especially in certain parts of the mountain. I was so in love with my then boyfriend though, that I wanted to make him happy, and knew how much he loved it there. So I didn't say anything at first. The first time I noticed the negative energy was about a week after we moved in. We went for a hike towards early evening. We wanted to explore the miles of wilderness behind our home and were excited. As we walked further along, we saw old abandoned ranches and log cabins. There was even one area that had some evidence of witchcraft. There were many local legends of a satanic cult that referred to themselves as goat men. As we walked into a thickly wooded area, all the hair on my body suddenly stood up and I noticed an electric charge in the atmosphere, along with the sizable deafening silence. I tried to ignore this creepy feeling and kept walking. A few minutes later, my husband stopped in front of me and said he had just realized we weren't on the trail anymore. We looked back and sure enough, there was no trail in sight. The sun was now setting and the scenery was disorienting. After about an hour of trying to find our way home, I started to cry. It felt like we were going in circles and I was sure we would end up as missing people, but fortunately found a trail that led us back home. I think it was this day that something from the land attached itself to me. Soon after the incident in the woods, I started to feel oppressed by something very dark. I started doing things that was really out of character for me. Like binge drinking and picking fights. I would almost go into a trance and from what my husband tells me, I'd run out into the forest and disappear for hours during fights even late at night. I'd have no recollection of this. I only remember standing in front of our house late at night, with cut up bare feet and being confused and disoriented. My husband would be upset and tell me he had been frantically looking for me for hours, but it never seemed to me as if any time had passed. I got a job working at a local church camp. I'm not super religious, but jobs up there are scarce, and I noticed that the only time I felt normal was while I was at work. I felt like I was having some kind of internal battle between good and evil. While I spiraled down at home, I got diagnosed with a severe illness that no doctor could really explain, was constantly in the hospital, and put on heavy narcotics which only aggravated my spiral downwards. 
We seemed to be having really bad luck too. For instance, one time my husband was driving in a really remote part of the mountain when his car broke down. So I jumped in my car to go fetch him when suddenly my car blew a gasket clean through the hood, which no mechanic had ever seen or could explain. I had to hitchhike to where my husband was and we had to tow both cars. My husband's car mechanically had nothing wrong with it at all. And it worked just fine after we towed it. Yet it would always break down periodically and always in a remote part of town with no cell service, as we lived way off the beaten path deep in the woods. Something always seemed to go wrong. Just before things could go wrong, I'd get that creepy feeling with my hair, where it stood on end, and the feeling of electricity in the atmosphere. As things progressed one day after drinking and taking pills, I remember feeling pulled out into the forest. I went stumbling through the woods sobbing and having an overwhelming urge to end myself. I kept thinking that this was the only way out. This was a common thing I started doing. And it was as if I was only in some kind of trance. I remember constantly feeling paralyzed with fear, sorrow and despair. I began to feel like my true self was gone and I couldn't get to her. I began to feel numb, regardless of how much I was unraveling at home. I still functioned at work and even managed to get a few promotions. I felt like I had two personalities. Around this time, weird things started happening in the house. It would start with electrical feelings, goosebumps, and then bam, all the lights and ceiling fans would turn on full blast on their own. I'd come home from work and think someone was in our house because all the lights would be on. One time I was sleeping and I could hear the remote control button for fan speed clicking on. And then all the lights turned on as well as the fans. I would get out of bed and yell, stop it and hide the remotes for the fans and TVs. But it started taunting me. It would turn on all the electronics late at night. If I lay down for a nap, or any time I was laying in a room feeling depressed. It was like it knew that that would push me over the edge. Around this time we felt an oppressive presence, like it was watching us sleep. It was only then that what had been causing these problems revealed itself to me. There was a small wooden door in our bedroom that led to the attic. And one night I had a nightmare that felt incredibly real of watching myself sleep from a different angle in the room when a pure black demon with tight black shiny skin, red eyes and a goat looking head and giant horns came out the door and was crouching down watching me sleep by my bedside while breathing what looked like smoke around my body. As it stood up and reached for me with its long pointy fingers, I suddenly woke up choking in a panic. I looked over and the attic door was open. Now that door was extremely hard to open. And you had to really tug at it due to it not fitting quite right and running against the door frame. We always left it shut because it was cold, creepy and drafty up there. Terrifying. After that, I dreaded going to sleep and would often stay up all night drinking and descending into madness. No matter where I was, I always had the sensation of being watched. But I was too afraid to sleep, especially in our room. When all the electronics would turn on, when I'd get goosebumps, I knew the demon was near. It really scared me that I couldn't see it. But I knew what it looked like, and I could feel its presence. Things at work eventually got weird too, and I could barely function. I felt like I was hanging on by a thread. I was an emotional wreck. And in heavy counseling, heavy drinking and pill popping. My relationship was on the rocks and I had become a regular at the bar and liquor stores. I was completely out of control and was beginning to get evil intrusive thoughts. One night I was in a rage and picked a fight with my husband. I don't remember it, but the next day when I was begging him for forgiveness, after he threatened to leave, he told me I didn't even look like myself, that my eyes and face looked dark 
and evil the previous night when we argued. Then he told me I had shoved and hit him, and my heart shattered to a million pieces. I'm not an angry or violent person at all normally. That broke me. I couldn't stop acting that way though, no matter how hard I tried. I hated myself. One night I got a friend from my hometown who also happens to have abilities. She told me the land there was bad, and that she wouldn't go up to visit me, and that I should consider moving home. She had a friend that also had moved up there after a divorce and experienced a similar oppression, and fled home in the middle of the night taking only her animals. She had seen something that she refuses to talk about. It clicked right then. Whatever was up there was evil and affecting me deeply. I broke down and begged my husband to leave. He's the type to do anything for me. So we both started job hunting in the town we wanted to move to, and he listed the house for sale. The second I got hired, I threw some clothes and my dog in the car and never looked back. Luckily, our home sold pretty quickly because we priced it to sell ASAP. The dread lifted slowly, and I made my way down the mountain and back into the city, and I felt like I could breathe. I remember thinking how dark it always felt up there with all the trees. It felt suffocating. Within a month of moving away, I started to feel back to normal. At first, there was still some activity like the demonic dreams, and one time being awoken by something that felt like a pillow hitting me with a crazy force across the face. But after I had a cleansing done by a Ricky master, it mostly stopped, and I completely lost any desire to drink and switched medications to a non-narcotic. I've never been a drinker, and to this day I have, on average, one or two beers a year. My personality went back to my happy, loving self. The dark thoughts seemed like a bizarre memory. My marriage is solid, and we are like any boring couple. After months of moving, we did receive a call from the couple who purchased our home, asking if we ever noticed any weird or demonic activity in the home. They kind of just made it a joke. Ha, never mind, we'll stick to our plan to get an exorcism done. I felt like there really was no point in telling them, as it was never the home, it was the land. It was like a horrible nightmare that creeps me out just sharing the story. I even avoid talking or thinking about it due to weird feelings it gives me. I feel like part of my soul is gone forever. I can never take it back, what I put my poor husband through. I'll never view things the same. I know there is real evil out there, and I want it my soul. Labor Day of 2015. My mother, my wife, and my three children and I went to a very remote cabin that we rented out. It was an old fire watchman station, or something of the sort. So I had the cabin and three other sheds slash shops. I'll try to keep it short. But this is a bizarre story. We unpacked, settled into the cabin, and then decided to walk a few hundred yards down the river barefoot. We got down to the pebbled shore, and were playing slash throwing rocks when I realized there were about one foot snakes everywhere. My wife, mum, and I yanked up the three kids and boogied off. After reaching a safe distance from them, I went back with a water bottle and caught one to see what it was. Turns out, we were in a nest of diamondback rattlesnakes. If one of these things latched onto one of my kids, they surely would not have survived. We were three hours away from any medical facility. We got back to the cabin, and my mum and I went for a hike slash walk alone, while my wife calmed the kiddos and fed them lunch. Upon returning 15 minutes later, all three of my kids and wife were inside with the doors and windows closed, even though we had left everything open for the place to cool off. We went inside to hear all four of them start yelling about a bear that was 150 yards from the cabin, huffing and puffing at the wife and kids on the front porch, eating. It was down by the river another 30 or so yards from the hill. 
and he poked his head up over and over. A few hours go by, and in that time an ATV passed three times, with two inbred looking freaks upon it. And each time they stopped in front of the gate, onto the property, and stared at us in the cabin. Keep in mind we're two hours into the wilderness in Idaho, with no sight of a person, the whole entire trip except for them. We decide it's bedtime for the kids, and it's pitch black out. Within 10 minutes, our son of five went from being perfectly fine to having a fever of 103, slightly foaming at the mouth and being completely unresponsive. It was at that point, we decided to leave immediately and go seek medical attention. I opened the front door to the cabin and started loading the two cars by the light of the porch. And that's when all three of us heard about four to six large and heavy animals running all around the cabin and the property. There was one on the right side of the house that I could hear pacing back and forth and breathing heavily. I made everyone stay indoors and close the door every time. And I went to transfer stuff to the cars. I had a stick and a big pot that I was smacking as hard as I could. And each time was yelling out loudly and randomly. As soon as I'm done loading, I take each kid out individually and load them up between the two cars, then escort my mum out and wife. My wife and I were in the lead car. So we pulled up out of the gate and for some stupid reason or another, I felt that I needed to close it. So I got out of my vehicle walked behind it and my mum's car and closed it. Now this gate was literally a log that slid from one post to the other. It offered zero protection or barrier between me and the animals out there. And right as I went to turn around, I heard a large padded foot walk up to me directly in front of me then more than 10 feet away. Then I see eyes shimmering from the moonlight as the deepest scariest growl I've ever heard in my life. I turn and run so fast I swear I must have jumped from where I was to the driver's seat up to the car some 30 feet behind me. And as I landed in the seat, I slammed into drive and spun out, finally leaving. About 15 minutes down the road, we were still panicking about our unresponsive son. And we both kept having this horrible, evil doom feeling like a shadow over us. I looked down and realized I still had that baby rattlesnake in the water bottle in my cup holder. So I grabbed it and threw it out the window immediately. Not even two minutes later, we heard our son softly crying. We realized he's responsive. And he stated something along the lines of Why are we leaving? What's going on? He was sad because he was sad to leave. He couldn't remember the last hour or so at all. My mother was about 58 years old at the time and has been a Jehovah's Witness my whole life, plus many more years beforehand. And she's the last person in the world that would believe in signs or evil or omens or whatever. The next day, my mum broke down extremely bad, sobbing her eyes out, hardly able to talk. And she confessed to my wife that the night before we left, she had a nightmare in which we went on a camping trip, came across snakes, a bear and a pack of wolves. She said, she knew a lot of bad things happened at that outpost. And it was full of evil. Most of all, she said, one of your kids passed away. I swear on my life to this very day. If I ask her who passed and how it happened, she immediately starts crying and refuse to talk of it. She lives her life now with a guilt that she willingly ignored her nightmare and put us in this situation nearly taking one of her dear grandkids away from the world. She doesn't deserve to feel like that. I know all of this sounds crazy. But a week later on the local news were reports of a wolf pack in that area. Wolves and bears may not coexist in harmony. But they do share territories and respect each other. This outpost station of sorts was about an hour and a half into the wilderness from Loman slash banks, Idaho if you want to verify the animals actually exist around there. Sadly, I grew up in the mountains for most of my pre slash early teen years, as did my wife until she was 10 years old, and even have a half sleeve of the wilderness slash trees on my left arm. 
but with that said, we don't care to go to the mountains anymore. The events described here took place in a small country in Northern Europe, sometime between 2008 and 2009, during the middle of the summer. I was about 17 years old back then, and spent a better part of the summer vacation helping my dad. He was a logger and his workday, as well as mine, started very early in the morning. We would wake up just before 4am, have a quick breakfast with coffee, dress up, get our gear, and drive out to the forest, which was around 15 to 20 kilometers away. My family lived in a rather small town surrounded by crop fields and forestry, near the country's border, and the aforementioned trip meant you would get far enough from civilization. Poor, often disappearing cell signal, old overgrown roads and absolutely no one who lives there. No one for you to meet, on your way to the felling. That's what they call a territory where loggers cut trees. To get to it, we need to park our 4x4 truck on the side of a narrow road, walk 2 kilometers through thick overgrowth, and then climb down a steep hill. The route to this particular felling did stand out though. On our way there, we would pass an old, long abandoned house that got my attention the first time I made this trip with my father. Judging by the appearance of the house, it was built at least 80 years ago, definitely before Soviet occupation, which meant that it could have been nationalized with the original owners possibly being deported after 1940. All of the windows were gone, as well as the window frames. The roof was also gone, but you could still make out the individual rooms because the walls and the floor of this house were still somewhat structurally sound. You could also make out a yard that was hidden beneath the overgrowth. On one of our trips, I noticed some posters and magazines lying on the floor in one of the rooms. It was from around the 80s, so I figured that was the last time someone had lived there. It was quite unsettling to find this abandoned property in the middle of nowhere, but it was only after our fourth or fifth trip that I realized its probable importance. We got to Felling, worked for about three hours, and decided to take lunch. It was a clear, sunny morning with no one around. Me and my dad sat on one of the bigger trees that we cut down previously, and proceeded to chow down on our sandwiches, taking occasional sips of coffee. Then, it began. Suddenly, we both heard a dog barking somewhere in the distance. This was already weird, since we never heard anything other than the ambience of the forest the previous days here. What made this even stranger was the fact that the barking noise was coming from within the forest, the part we had yet to chop down and saw our way into. Me and my dad both stopped eating, looked at each other, and without saying a word agreed that we would keep listening, and turned our heads towards the forest from where the occasional bark was coming. I eventually said, must be a stray dog or something. Or maybe someone lives nearby. My dad nodded in affirmation. As we resumed our lunch, it became clear that the barking was nearing our position, and now it was accompanied by distinct human-like footsteps, breaking branches, shoving leaves, and so on. It unnerved me a bit, but I quickly realized that soon enough, somebody would definitely emerge from the forest, probably someone else who was logging near us, although it would not explain the dog, as taking your pet to the felling would be very unusual, not to mention potentially dangerous for the animal. The barking continued, and the footsteps got louder and closer, close enough that both the person and the dog should be clearly visible. The sound stopped around 30 to 32 yards from where we sat, then resumed. Me and my dad kept looking in that direction and seeing absolutely nothing, the footsteps and the barking carried on. These sounds now came from a cleared out area, where we should not have been able to see anyone or anything that stood or moved. We looked at each other in complete bewilderment and didn't speak. I could even hear the dog panting and sniffing around with an occasional step being taken by apparently no one. 
After 40 seconds, the sound indicated that this, whatever this was, was moving away from us, not back where it came from, but to the left. Soon enough, the sounds got very faint and disappeared. Me and my dad exchanged a few quick theories, but it was clear that neither of us understood what we had just experienced. We resumed work and left the place around the time we usually did. And I passed the house described earlier and got chills thinking that maybe what we witnessed is somehow connected to this haunting abandoned property. I should state that we were both well rested that day and used to this type of work. This took place before I started using alcohol and my dad had been a non-drinker all his life. I should also mention that neither of us are a skeptic. I have an open mind to these type of things and they interest me. I've read up on it, but we certainly don't spend much time talking of it. This is one of the creepier things that has happened to me. And I often wonder if it was a ghost and his dog returning to their abandoned property. So me, my boyfriend, his best friend and his girlfriend drove up to Big Bear. Then a day later, another friend of ours drove up and he was supposed to sleep downstairs and couple sleep upstairs since there are only two bedrooms in the Airbnb. The first night we stayed there, it was kind of creepy because the cabin was pretty remote. And of course, there's absolutely no light outside. It's in the woods with coyotes howling and bears, but nonetheless completely normal activity. The next night at midnight, my boyfriend and I are in bed, when suddenly, our friend sleeping downstairs comes banging on the door freaking out saying he saw shadows in the woods, and that the motion lights came on and there was thumping outside. We got a little freaked out but my boyfriend gets out of bed and checks the entire cabin, and even goes outside. There's nothing. We go up to the other couple's room, where there's a porch with a sliding glass door that looks out into the woods. It's important to note that I'm naturally very anxious and scared. While my boyfriend is a rock. He's calm and logical while I tend to jump to the worst scenario. My boyfriend goes over to check the last place in the cabin. So he pulls the curtain and jumps and yells, Oh my god. At this point, I'm terrified. My boyfriend is 180 pounds and a CrossFit coach. And to see a big guy like that scared is nauseating. He locked the door and started backing away slowly. There's a large man standing outside staring at us. He's just standing in the woods staring. At this point, I think he's messing with me. Go lock the door, he says to me. That's when I knew he was serious. Everyone is freaking out. I run and lock the door behind us. And we all decide to stay in the room to keep an eye out. It's the middle of summer. And it's really hot. But we refuse to open a window. I'm so scared. But trying not to show it as everyone else seemed to have calmed down. Half hour goes by and nothing happened. I get annoyed with the heat and the fact that there are five people in a tiny room, and three of them are men, so my boyfriend and I go back to our room. I'm still pretty spooked, so my boyfriend tries to cheer me up. At this point, it's about 1.30, and I told him I was too scared to sleep with the lights off. He tells me that's totally fine, and he understands, so we just lay with the lights completely on. Finally, I start drifting to sleep when I hear a thud. I sit up, and look at my boyfriend. And then he looks at me. And the power cuts. I immediately start sobbing. I'm trembling. I can't see anything because it's pitch black. I try to get out of bed and run but my legs get tangled in the sheets and I fall. My boyfriend picks me up. We grab our phone run to the other room where everyone else was staying. And I'm hysterical at this point. I try to contact our host, but nothing will go through. I try to call my dad, but all of our phones say no service. We are there alone. Thank God the friend who drove up after us had a different carrier because his phone had one bar. So he calls the local sheriff. 
He's on the phone with him and they transfer us to the utilities company. We give the address and they tell us that we're too far in the woods and they don't cover that area. At this point, we're wondering if the entire area has no power or if the man outside had just cut our power. I cry more and we call 911 to report suspicious activity and power outage and they send in the fire department. A few hours go by and it's 3am and suddenly the power comes back on. We fall asleep and the next day we spoke to some of the locals in the area. We told them our power went out and he said that was strange and shouldn't have happened. He told us the only reason that happens out here is because of a snowstorm and he couldn't explain it. I'm pretty sure it was the creepy man in the woods. In any case, I really would rather never meet again. When I lived in rural Maine, my boyfriend at the time took me on a drive in his truck. He wanted to show me something he said he learned about from one of his college professors. We already kind of lived in the middle of nowhere, but we drove even further into literally nowhere. We were on this road that was five to eight miles of just forest on both sides. No houses, no signs, no driveways, nothing. Then he pulls over near a slight break in the trees. There was a very overgrown old driveway chained off at the road with an old dilapidated sign that said private property. We parked on the road and walked in about a half mile and there was this old abandoned lock cabin house. I didn't know when it was built, but it was old enough to not have any connection to the electric grid and no electrical outlets inside. It was a bit odd, but my boyfriend said he had been there before and led me to a door in the back where we could break in. He mentioned that the last property owner said in their will that no changes could be made to the property after they died like no agriculture or major renovations. So I guessed that's why the land was never resold since nobody could do anything with it. I don't remember if we entered through the second floor somehow or climbed upstairs, but I remember being on this loft that overlooked the interior of the house with no railing. Definitely a 15 plus foot drop right at the edge of the loft. Maybe there weren't stairs inside at all or a ladder. It was back in the fall of 2011, when I was a freshman in college, so it's all a little bit fuzzy. I remember seeing an old wood stove made of iron downstairs and a countertop, but otherwise I think the place was pretty sparse and made entirely of wood. There was also no sink in the kitchen area and no bathroom, so no plumbing either. The loft we were on had literally thousands of dead flies all over the floor. It was both gross and creepy. I know they could have just gotten stuck in there over the years, but the sheer volume and number of them on every surface and not being decayed or turned to dust was just unnerving. My boyfriend for some reason decides this is a nice place to smoke weed. I didn't want to stay, but he laid a blanket over the flies and he sat and rolled the joint. I did take a few puffs, but started getting an uneasy feeling, so I stopped. I'm a regular smoker, but this was just a crazy situation. Then suddenly I realized that the sun was setting and we were losing light fast. The house very quickly got this terrifying impending doom feeling and I knew I needed to get the hell out of there. I expressed my concerns to my boyfriend multiple times each time seeming more desperate to leave, but he wasn't worried and took his sweet ass time hand rolling himself a cigarette and taking all the unnecessary stuff out of his pockets, laying them out on the blanket and slowly putting them away. It was pissing me off that he wasn't taking me seriously and I had such a sense of urgency to get out. I ended up getting out of the house and started hauling ass down that half mile long, dirt driveway to get out and away. My boyfriend shuffled behind me, fumbling with things in his hand. He was practically a prepper and carried all sorts of things with him in his pockets, cargo pants, backpack, 
all the time. Like flashlights, lighters, weed pipes, rolling paper, weed, rolling tobacco, and probably 20 other things he thought were useful. I got out of the woods when we were just losing that last light before the true darkness set in. Mind you, this country road has no street lights the whole way. He had flashlights, but I didn't feel like the flashlights meant safety. I felt like we were being watched and whatever it was was super negative. I don't know if I overreacted or my boyfriend was literally just doped up and clueless, but I never really trusted him after that. I don't know why the heck I let myself get into that situation. Needless to say, he's not in my life anymore. I used to wander the old abandoned mines, cabins and grounds of Montana, areas people hadn't been in at least three decades. I knew every cabin too. I knew people who'd been there decades prior, when there were still crazy old gold panning loony types who'd never give up the hope to find big. I remember one story my father has with one of those people. My father and his brother were looking into this one area and a shot went over their heads. My father and uncle froze and said they were just hiking. The old man said they were trying to steal and my father said who his grandma was, who had lived in the mountains since the early 60s. The old man then stopped, said to thank their mother for feeding him when he was starving one winter, but that he wasn't taking visitors that day and to get lost. About a decade ago, my father and I found the dilapidated cabin that the man was in by chance, wandering randomly through the woods. It was really hard to find, and we had just barely come across it. Everything the old man had was still there. The roof was partially caved in, pots and pans were still on the stove, like he had passed in there or nearby. There was no body though, just everything was there covered in decades of normal decay, frozen in time, tools and all. It was a museum, a hundred years in the past, but only my father and I knew how to visit it. The old man must have passed at least 30 years ago, since he was so old when my father saw him. That cabin was bulldozed to build millionaire cabins eight or so years ago, along with dozens of other secret museums of the gold rush past. I used to know every secret path of that woods for miles in every direction to every secret cabin, game trail, and serene, natural rest stop. It is all now an empty cul-de-sac with no cabins because the money stream ran dry. I think that is the scariest and saddest part, frankly. So for my birthday this year, my adoring boyfriend decides to rent us a little A-line cabin in the woods of the White Mountains. Originally, we had plans to stay Friday and Saturday night, but only ended up staying Friday, for reasons I will explain later. We get there Friday around 2 o'clock. We bring our things in and both of us get a weird vibe from the jump, but neither of us say anything to one another because we really wanted to have a good time. First things first, and my boyfriend starts to make a fire for the fireplace. He does so by taking a large knife and shaving pieces of wood off the logs for the kindling. The tip of the knife breaks and he says to me, this will be much harder to stab you with later tonight. I look at him like, what the hell is he saying to me? And why would he ever say that? We sit by the fire until the evening, barely saying anything to each other. The TV is right in front of a giant window with no curtains. We end the night by watching a movie in front of said scary window. We go upstairs to sleep and my boyfriend barricades us in our room. I ask him why, and he says he has a bad feeling. I wake up in the middle of the night because I have to pee, but I'm too afraid to go alone. So I wake my boyfriend up and he accompanies me to the restroom. I text my best friend before I fall asleep, saying that I don't feel right in the house. We wake up and I thank my boyfriend for coming with me to the restroom when I was scared last night, and he informs me he took me to the bathroom after we did it. I assure him we never did, and he swears we did. Anyway, moving on, we wake up and drive through the White Mountains. We get home around 1, and he says he's tired and goes upstairs to take a nap. 
During this time, he's taking a nap. I have zero recollection of what I did during this time. He wakes up from the nap, and we both decide that we need to leave and something's not right. We pack all our stuff in five minutes and dipped quickly after. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. News, news, news. There is news which I have to share with you. And it goes a little something like this. Every time I upload now, YouTube has a new fancy special uploader. And you are allowed to say whether your video breaches any of YouTube's terms of service, which for the most part, mine do not. A number of weeks ago, I published a video on creepy dreams and nightmares. Good video, I enjoyed making it. There was one story that I placed towards the end that was a graphic dream about people in pretty nasty situations. I don't want to say what it was at risk of this video being demonetized too. So anyway, I accidentally, well, I didn't, I thought because it was a dream, it wouldn't really count, but I don't think YouTube sees it that way. And they demonetized the video. You know, fair enough, I respect that. Um, but then now every time I upload, YouTube is basically saying, we don't trust your judgment, so we need to review all your videos. It takes them a little bit of time to turn on the monetization now for when a video launches. So you know, if you're here from the very start, if you'd like, if you watch my video the moment it's launched, you probably won't get an ad. And that's probably great for you, but it's not so great for me. So, um, so what I'm gonna do is the story that I, I did a video the other day and I had to take a story out because I thought it was a bit graphic. Um, and what I've decided to do, I launched out my Patreon for all those lovely people. Thanks guys. And when you, you can't actually build up your YouTube reputation score, score system without uploading something that YouTube has to agree that's bad. And then you lose demonetization for it. Do you get what I mean? So I can publish 1000 perfect ad friendly videos, but none of that matters unless I say to YouTube, I'm uploading stuff that isn't suitable. So don't advertise me. And only when I do that, does it appear that my reputation is going to, am I going to be trustworthy? So tomorrow at some point, I'm going to upload a video that it's just going to be four minutes or three minutes, however long the story is. And it's just going to be this really short story. And I'm going to label it as unadvertiser friendly. So YouTube can help build my reputation. I might have to launch these every once in a while. Um, just to kind of appease the YouTube gods and build up my credibility again. So I just wanted to let you know that I had a great birthday, everyone. Thank you for all your well wishes. It really does make me very happy to receive messages from all of you. Um, even if you don't think I read your comment, I, I really do try to read them all and get back to most of you. So thank you. Um, my voice is kind of going now. <laughs> I'm just really grateful for all you guys. So thanks for sticking around, but I hope you enjoyed tonight's video. Gonna carry on the outdoorsy theme tomorrow. Probably gonna put a poll up for that. Um, so yeah, I need to check what we've got and then I'll let you decide based on what we do have. Maybe even another cryptid video. I think you guys last the like, like, liked the last one. I'm going to leave it here. As always, a huge thanks to my lovely patrons whose names have been on screen. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. If you want to donate a little bit every month, you know, you, you get some perks and stuff. All the info's in the description on the Patreon page. Thanks. But for now, it's time for me to sign off and try and recover my voice. Stay awesome. And I'll see you in the next one.